I work for Advancement Project, which is a national racial justice organization based in Washington, DC. And we work by partnering with grassroots organizing groups and supporting their campaigns in voting rights, ending the school to prison pipeline, mass incarceration, policing, and immigrant justice. And I have spent my career focused on issues um, dealing with the criminal legal system. And now I'm bringing a racial justice analysis and lens to that work. Um, just for like a very quick background, I started my career as a public defender in New York City um, in Brooklyn, where I was representing people charged with crimes who are too poor to afford an attorney. And then did that work for about four and a half years and started to become really curious about what was happening in Michigan. And so I started doing my own research um, and like really just like talking to anyone who would listen to me or answer my questions about what was happening and, and found that the situation here was like very dire, very concerning. And the state had actually been sued for their failure to, to um, acknowledge people's Sixth Amendment right to counsel. And so people around the state were basically facing very serious charges and doing it without an attorney because um, there are some states where there's a state funded public defender system. And then there are some states where each county is responsible for funding their own public defender system. And Michigan is a state where it's a county funded entity. And so there are 83 counties in Michigan and pretty much 83 different systems of providing this Sixth Amendment right to counsel. And so at the time I was doing this research, the state was being forced to create an agency to provide oversight for the, the administration of indigent. And I applied to work for them and got hired. So I came back to Michigan for about 18 months and worked around this state to support courts rebuild their public defender system and to make sure they were constitutionally sound. And then after doing that work, which was really great and eye-opening, and it was right after the 2016 election, and it was really helpful um, and illuminating for me to see how powerful things are at the local level. Because I think people think that like the federal level is like what really counts, but I, am, I have been convinced that I think the most power exists for the issues I care about at the local and state level. Um, so after that experience, I then decided that I wanted to be a bit more agitational in my work and wanted to talk more explicitly about race. And like, I saw the job at Advancement Project a few times and I was like, I don't think that's the role. But then I just applied and I got it and then moved to DC. And now I'm doing work that I really believe in in a way that I didn't even know was possible. Um, so we work again by supporting local organizing and, and building power in communities of color and in other marginalized communities. And we bring strategic communications, litigation, and um, community organizing support. So in Michigan, I work closely with Michigan Liberation, which is a grassroots organizing group that's focused on transforming the criminal legal system across the state. And part of that work um, is focused on the bail system. Um, over COVID, I thought things would be really quiet like because I travel so much and so much of our work is in the community. But then we ended up suing four jails across the country for failing to provide adequate protection against COVID-19 for people who are incarcerated. And two of the four jails are in Michigan. We sued the Oakland County Jail and the Wayne County Jail. And I'm the lead attorney on the Wayne County Jail litigation. And so one of the issues that is kind of a through line in all of the work that we're doing is the unconstitutional bail system that a lot of people are fighting. And we know that people of color are disproportionately impacted by the criminal legal system. Communities of color and poor. It's my professional opinion that we are investing resources in the wrong things that 
policing gets way too much money from local, state, and federal government, and that we should be pouring resources into services and accommodations to address the root causes of behaviors that are criminalized. And all of this comes together in local jails and prisons where people are literally in jails because they're too poor to afford nominal bail. Um, for people that are less familiar, when someone gets charged with a crime, they go in front of a judge and the judge decides if they're a flight and or safety risk and then makes a determination on if they feel like they're a flight or safety risk, how much money they should have to pay in order to get out of jail to ensure that they'll come back. And in a place like Detroit, which sits in Wayne County, where people are like extremely poor, it's not uncommon for someone to be sitting in jail for a $500 bond that no one they know can pay for them. And then you find um, bail bondsmen who charge a lot of money and require some sort, some sort of surety to ensure that the person will come back. Um, and a very short stay in jail can have really disruptive and really detrimental impact on someone's life. So if you think about someone who's working an hourly job, if they don't come in for a couple of days, they're gonna get fired. Um, people that are single parents who are raising their children alone, if they get picked up and there's no one to watch their kids, now we're talking about someone who's gonna lose their children and will be ensnared in the, um, it's been called like the Jane Crow system because so many women are caught in the, in the family welfare system, but like now you're in a fight to try and keep your children. Um, also the costs associated with incarceration, phone calls, food, all of those things come together when someone is trapped inside of a jail. I also just quickly wanna differentiate between jail and prison because I think some people use the terms interchangeably, but they're very different. Jails are in local communities and are often run by sheriffs. Prison is where you go after you've already been convicted of a crime and you're gonna be there for more than a year. So usually people stay in jail during, the, during their case while they're fighting it. And then if they're serving a year or less of a sentence, if you're gonna be serving more than a year, typically you go to a prison. And in Michigan, there's one women's prison, which is Huron Valley, excuse me, and then 30 other prisons for men around the state, including the Upper Peninsula. So another quick thing that I like to highlight is that 30% of the prison population comes from Wayne County. And so it's not uncommon for someone who's from Detroit, whose entire family is in Detroit, to be in the Upper Peninsula which means that there's not gonna be a lot of contact. And we see that as a type of family separation because your incarcerated loved one is no longer accessible to you. And a lot of people don't have the resources to take a trip, you know, six hours to the Upper Peninsula, get a hotel, pay for gas, pay for meals to see their person. Um, I also just wanna note that when someone is incarcerated, it costs about $3 for a 15 minute phone call. So for people that again, don't have disposable income, they rack up a lot of debt trying to keep in touch with someone who's incarcerated. So we are basically focused on trying to keep people out of prison by getting them out of jail at the earliest stage, which would be pretrial. Um, Wayne County has a very bad practice of incarcerating people for things like driving violations, driving without a license, driving without car insurance. And so very recently, we had some of the highest insurance rates in the country. A lot of people drive between Oakland and Wayne County and Oakland, I'm sorry, Macomb and Wayne County to get to work and can be like essentially captured because they don't have the resources to do the things that they need to do to drive legally. There are people in jail for that. There are people in jail for low level misdemeanors. There are people who are battling drug addictions who are incarcerated. And then there are people who um, have more serious charges, but the reason that they have that they are engaged in whatever behavior that has been criminalized, the root cause of that is poverty. Um, 
And so Michigan Liberation has been doing a bailout for the past three years. Um, this will be year three. Um, that's focused on Black women and girls. Um, and we know that there is conversation about the criminal legal system and mass incarceration, but we don't hear very much about women. And that is an area that I've become particularly um, interested in focusing on. My mom has become interested in focusing on that. Um, and I really appreciate her work um, on these issues as well, because I'm not always here. And she's been doing a lot of the engaging with directly impacted women who are trying to rebuild their lives after incarceration. Um, and so the goal of the project is basically to just get as many women out of jail as possible at the earliest stage. 80% of incarcerated women are mothers. Two thirds of incarcerated women are women of color, which is a grossly disproportionate representation since we know that black people represent about 15% of the population of this country. And the Wayne County Jail is just no place for anyone, um, but especially not people who are the matriarchs or the community leaders of their families. And so that's a bit about the project. I don't know, Seth, if you were able to share the report, but there's some information in data about the bail system here in that report. I've not, um, I've not Ashley. I also just want to lift, you You didn't? I did not, yeah. It's, okay, um, I can put the link in the chat um, to a report that I co-authored last year and some other resources that I sent after the last presentation just to learn more about the bail system and kind of how these issues are impacting people locally. The other thing I'll just say is that like, of course there are people who are accused of committing crimes I don't think that the way that we respond to that sort of community harm is adequate. And I encourage people all the time to really pay attention to local elections like judges because they are the ones who ultimately set these bonds and decide who stays in jail and who is released. It is also still a pandemic. I meet regularly with the lawyers representing Wayne County and we fight about things like if people are actually having access to masks we're in a fight right now about what the vaccination rollout looks like for people who are incarcerated. Um, and I also tell people to think about sheriffs because I think sheriffs go a lot, like under a lot of people's radars, but are actually the people responsible for managing local jails, including Wayne County and Oakland. So that's like a summary I, I don't know if people want to ask questions or if there's something that I should cover that I haven't yet. Yeah, Ashley, can I, can I ask a, a kind of a foundational question? Um, someone is arrested, a, a woman is arrested in Wayne County for driving without a license, for example, or having no insurance. And um, she goes before a judge and the judge sets um, bail. Um, of uh, what, what would be a typical bail for, for, for that kind of offense? We could say 2,500. Okay. And, and, uh, this, and, and the woman then has, has to either put up $2,500. Is that right? I mean, is that, is that the amount she would have to, to put up in order to, to meet bail? There's, so sometimes judges do what's called a 10%. So the bond is $2,500 and 10%, which would mean she has to put up $250 in order to get out. So sometimes they, they say like um, no 10%, which means that the person has to pay the full amount of the bond. Mm -hmm. And sometimes they'll do a 10%, which means that you only have to put up a piece of the total amount. Okay. That and, you're, that and, you're. And would the would the woman have access to a bail bondsman, and how would that how might that work? It really depends. In for a bonds person to work, you have to have an asset. So, like, you have to have a house or a car or something that you can put up to ensure that if they don't get their money, they can take your asset. And because so many people are so poor they don't have an asset that they can use to use a bonds person. I also think that 
I, I think because it's what we, we used to call nuisance bail. Like it's enough to keep someone inside, but not enough that like a bonds person would put up the amount of money for you. So like if someone has like a $500 bond, it would be hard for a bonds person to put that amount up because it it's it's such a low amount for them. Mm-hmm. Like they like to put up the 10% on a larger amount so that they can be guaranteed to get a larger amount back if the person doesn't come back to jail or come back to court. Okay. And and what what, what in your experience has been the 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 factors which causes a judge to allow a 10 percent as opposed to the full amount i think a lot of it is the severity of the crime that they're accused of so like if someone is accused of a shooting i think a judge is going to remove any likelihood that the person's going to get out so they mm-hmm. wouldn't put up they wouldn't give the 10 percent option okay um I also think people's criminal record plays a factor into that. So like if someone has a long record, they're less, they, in their mind, the person is less likely to come back to court. But the reason that that's unconstitutional and the reason that Wayne County got sued two years ago is because the constitutional standard really is ability to pay. Um, And like, you're not supposed to just do an amount that you know someone can't pay. You're supposed to do an inquiry into ability to pay and then make a reasonable determination after that. And what we see and what I think we've all seen is people that have like very serious charges but who are wealthy can post the money that they need to post to get out. Whereas someone who's poorer and might not be charged with as serious of a crime just doesn't have the money that they need to post the bond to get out. So it really is a system where you are forced to pay for your freedom. And if you have the money to pay for that, then you can get out. And if you don't, then you're going to sit there. And circling back to how we started, the indigent defense system has come a very long way, but there are still people in there who are not receiving adequate representation and could sit in jail for like really honestly years fighting a low level case because they don't have adequate representation and they don't have the money to get out. Are are you focusing on on, on particular level, on on women who who have been arrested and are in jail with particular levels of charges? Or, or are you, are you focused more broadly on, on, on anyone who is poor and, and who is uh, uh, who is in effect denied bail? So the most immediate project is focused on women who are inside of jails and prisons and jails. Because last year COVID exploded, the bailout expanded to include anyone who had like a reasonably low bail and could get out. Um, one of the challenges of doing bailouts is that you have to make a decision. Are you going to bail out a bunch of people with lower level cases that where the money will go further to higher level cases, but they're going to take more of the money that you have access to? Um, I would say for women, it's a little bit more, it's, a little bit broader because there just aren't as many women in the Wayne County Jail. Um, but like at one point during my lawsuit, we there were like seven pregnant women in the jail. And so we were trying to prioritize getting them out because they were pregnant. And like, you know, I don't think a pregnant woman during a pandemic should really be in jail. So it's like those types of determinations and it also just depends on like the population at one point like last year there were like 850 people in the jail because they were releasing people but now the population's climbing again and so I think there's more people inside I don't have the exact numbers right now but I can get those yeah and and what do you seek 
um, volunteer organizations to help put up the money to um, to 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 pay the bail. If that's the, is that the right way to describe it? You pay the bail. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's a mix. Michigan Liberation did a really good job of getting like local donations. And I think they said the average donation from like community members was $38. And they were able to raise a significant amount of money from just like surveying the local community. We also helped facilitate a relationship with the RFK Foundation, the Robert F. Kennedy Foundation that has a very serious focus on bail reform around the country because that's an issue that Robert F. Kennedy cared about during his life. And so like they've gotten foundation money as well. And then locally, there's an organization called the Bail Project, which is a national organization that has a site in Detroit, but they have their own rubric and their own way of assessing who they're going to support. And they don't focus, like they wouldn't have like a woman focused bailout um, and they have different criteria. I think Michigan Liberation is like, frankly, more willing to put up a riskier bond, like someone who like has a more serious case or a higher bond, whereas the bail project really only, they don't do any sort of like domestic violence bond. They don't like to do those bails and they have a $5,000 limit. Who else has questions for Ashley? Ashley, I don't know if you can share, but one of the stories that stayed with me so much from our last session with you, and it, it just illustrated some of the complications. And it was about one of the women that had been pregnant and had the baby in jail and then couldn't, you guys had to help her facilitate. I, I was hoping you could tell that story again because it was just so profound and, and I think give, illustrates the, how complicated the process can be because of who she could live with, who she could go home be released yeah too. do you mind so no no so I just always feel like I'm talking so much but um I was doing a project for work on the parole system so people are very familiar with probation oftentimes probation is used instead of a jail sentence or after a jail or prison sentence um and it's like a monitoring where someone has to adhere to different conditions and they have to check in with the court to make sure that they're following these rules. It's kind of, it's like a, a community supervision mechanism. But after someone spends time in prison, most of them have to be under some sort of parole. Parole is a really serious type of community supervision that if you mess up, you could just go back to prison to serve the rest of your term. Like if you get out a little bit early, well, Michigan has truth in sentencing. So most people that, that like if a judge says you have, you're being sentenced to five to 10 years in Michigan, they're not letting you out before that five years. There are some states like in New York, you could be paroled at like three and a half years and serve the rest of that sentence outside of the community, like outside of prison. In Michigan, they don't do that, which is part of why there's such high rates of incarceration because they make you serve like day for day of your sentence. And so a lot of times people come out of prison and they're forced into the parole system, which is a very serious surveillance mechanism. And parole officers give you a very long list of conditions, but they don't make sense and they're not gender or trauma informed. So basically they've taken a system that's designed for men and apply those same standards to women. So um, in the process of doing research on the parole system, I was introduced to a group of women who are living on the east side of Detroit in a halfway house right across from city airport. And I spent some time talking to them about their experiences and I just couldn't believe what they were dealing with. Like one woman had been in prison for like 30 years Another had been in and out for like five years because she had a drug addiction and wasn't treating the addiction, which would lead her to violate her parole. And then she was just back and forth to prison. 
but these women are required to like check in with their officers, which means you have to get to the parole office, which is on Lawton. It's right off 94 in Grand River. It's like this big office that you have to check in to. Um, you're supposed to like get a job. You're supposed to go to school if you need to get your GED. Um, and there's other things like you're not supposed to be around people with a felony conviction. But if you're living in a halfway house, mm-hmm. how are you supposed to avoid being around people with a felony conviction? And I mean, frankly, if you go to the parole office, how are you supposed to avoid being around people with a felony conviction? Because everyone's there because they have a felony conviction. Um, and so I was just really blown away. These women didn't have any money. They had never like had real supports in the community. So like if they didn't know how to do a resume or really like how to prepare for an interview or like there's a lot of like training people in the local community but I don't think people know about them and I think we've become a society that relies very heavily on technology and forget that there are serious technology gaps a lot of places but particularly in Detroit and so they just were like kind of deserted in this halfway house and one of the women um, had a very serious conviction. She had a lot of parole conditions. And one of the conditions was that she couldn't be around children, but she got pregnant. And in her mind, that meant that she couldn't be around her own child. So she was planning to put her baby up for adoption when we met. And so we talked and I can't control myself. And I was like, do you want to put your baby up for adoption? Because if you don't, we should talk about like what that means. Like how can we get around this? Like essentially you terminating your parental rights because you feel like based on your parole conditions, you can't be around kids. So I talked to my mom and my mom helped us um, connect with a family court expert and they divide, and, and also I was in contact with the Michigan Department of Corrections because I reached out to the person who was in charge of reentry, and I was like, do you understand that you have women that you've placed these standards for men on and you didn't contemplate that a woman could get pregnant? And what do these conditions mean for someone who's trying to figure out like parenting? And so basically we were able to make, a, like they were willing to make accommodations to her conditions so that she could be around her own child but we also had to ensure that there was someone who could take the baby but not terminate her parental rights so they did like a family custody arrangement I also just want to note that a lot of people in the criminal legal system are forced onto electronic monitoring so like tethers and ankle monitors And when you go into hospitals in Detroit and you have an ankle monitor on, they automatically send social services in to question you and to determine your fitness as a parent, which I think is traumatic if you're like laying there giving birth and there's someone who's interrogating you about whether or not you can parent. And also because of my client's situation, they immediately took her baby from her. And so while we were trying to figure all of this out, she was separated from the baby she'd just given birth to. And so all of that trauma is a result of incarceration and all the ways that I think oppressive systems of mass incarceration and surveillance are able to interfere with people's lives. Um, And so that that's what happened with that case. And my mom and I are still very much in touch with the woman and her baby. Um, Ashley, I'm sorry, but the other thing about the parole, remember she had a C-section and her parole officer insisted, like, so she had the baby like on Tuesday, he insisted that she show up on Friday to meet with uh, her parole officer. I mean, it was just really, you know, and when you talk about not having, making accommodations, reason, I mean, I just couldn't believe that this woman was being forced to be out, you know, and about, you know, right after she had had, you know, not only had a baby, but had a C-section. Oh, right, and it was the winter. 
Uh, other questions for Ashley? Ashley, I want to ask about just the mechanics of, of Can this. I hear me? No. Oh, who was that, Ashley? Who said, can you hear me? <laughs> She's frozen. Oh. Uh, that's not good. Does she does she leave the meeting and come back in to be on the It might clear itself up, or she may just have to do that. Yeah, yeah. She looks very thoughtful about it, though. Yeah. Yeah, she's gonna come back in. She just left. Yeah. She lost. Oh, There's... I'm sorry. Did someone has another question or? Yeah, I, I had a question, uh, a, a question about the mechanics of, of this, actually. Um, let, let, let's say that, that Christ Church was interested in, in assisting in some way with the, with the bailout. Um, we, we, would, we would contribute, you know, X dollars to the bail project. It would be used to help post bail for for um, for women and if uh, for a woman and if the if the woman showed up for her hearing, then the the money the, there, there's no forfeiting of the money. Is that is that am I correct? Am I correct? Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Sorry, this internet kicked me off, but I heard your question. You were asking how the money is is used if you were to make a donation? Yeah. So yeah, it would be used to um, bond people out as a part of the bailout. But because you're Detroit based and because I think what I'm gathering is that there's an interest in like engaging around these issues um, longer term, I think there's a couple things that could happen. There could be a donation that's made and then Michigan Liberation just does the bailouts and the people get out. But I also know that like, we've been having conversations about people who might not be incarcerated, but they have significant fines and fees that if they get picked up on the wrong day, they're gonna go to jail. So like people that have like a lot of outstanding tickets um, or fines and fees associated with a conviction, like those people need resources also um, another thing that we've been talking about is like people that can get out of jail, but still have a lot of other needs like transportation. One thing we've been talking about is like feminine products. So like a lot of women who are ensnared in the criminal legal system, they don't have the money they need to just like meet their basic needs. So one thing that my mom and I have been doing is like raising money to give people feminine products bus passes, we bought winter coats, like things that you really just need to survive that like, I think kind of get lost in the shuffle of, of existing. And I think there are organizations that are trying to help people, but there's just so many little things that I think fly under the radar that people need support with. And, and how, how would we connect if we wanted to, if we wanted to do something like what you just mentioned, um, how, how would how would we connect with with the 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 women in need? Would it be through Michigan Liberation, or how how would that work? I would suggest starting with Michigan Liberation. I invited their campaign director Nick tonight, but he had a funders meeting, um, and so he couldn't make it. But I would suggest connecting with Michigan Liberation. Um, and then th there's that. But then like we, like my family is connected to these women who are around the city. And like, we just take stuff directly to the halfway house um, because they're constantly getting new women and they all, ha they have many of the same needs. But I would say for like an initial like foray into this 
making a donation and then beginning the conversation about what a longer term investment could look like would be the way to go. Could, could you forward to us the, con the contact information for Michigan Liberation? Yes. I could act, yes. I can do that and I can also just send a connecting email. Okay. Um, with, for you all as well. Okay. And just also really quickly, like part of what I've been working on since I've been home we're doing a storytelling project right now where we hired a photographer to follow eight formerly incarcerated women. Um, and like, it's like a day in their lives to kind of illustrate the whole range of human beings that are caught in this system. Cause I think there's a lot of misconceptions about who these people are and who is inside of jails and prisons. And so one of the things we're really focusing on is I don't like to use the word humanize, but trying to humanize this population and like make it make this make these realities more relatable to people so i'll also share that project with you all as well and then um i was gonna say something else and now i can't remember but oh there's also going to be a legislative campaign to try and end cash bail in michigan so I think my next project will be supporting Michigan Liberation's efforts to pass this legislation. And so there are, that's another way that the local community can tap in to these, these efforts to, to transform the criminal legal system. Yeah, Josephine. Um, I just want to ask, actually does Michigan Liberation have like a revolving fund for the bailout project? that if you make a contribution, and I think what Seth was saying before was, so if you um, make the contribution and the money gets used um, to um, pay people's bond, when people show up for court, the, or the fund gets the money back? Yeah, it's a so, revolving bail fund. Okay, so it is a revolving bail fund, okay. Yeah, sorry, the internet just completely kicked me off. So I had to come back on my phone. Um, on Sunday when we met, I thought that the, um, and I can't remember her name, but um, the person who was talking about the fun, she was saying about um, the fact that it was something like 99% um, of the people who have been bonded out show up for court. And so that there's, you know, a very, very high rate um, of responsibility that people are exercising with regard to this so that the fund is not really losing money, um, you know, as a result of people's behavior, but people are being very responsible, you know, in terms of their duty to come back to court, you know, over time. Yeah, they have a really high success rate. Uh, it, 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 it strikes me that, that, that there are two, two options here, um, not, not mutually exclusive. I mean, bo both could be pursued. W one is to, is to try to contribute some money to this revolving uh, bail fund. The, the, other, the other is to, is to assist you, Ashley, and you, Josephine, and I see Al hiding back there too, hey, um, it, to, um, um, it, with regard to the women in the halfway house, um, trying to provide all sorts of different help to, to them. Are, are those the two, I mean, I, I suppose there's an advocacy, there's an advocacy role, which is a third one, but are, 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 are those kind of the, 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 the different ways in which Christchurch or, or interested parishioners could become involved? That sounds right to me. Um, I mean, I, I, there's, a, there's actually like many more ways. I, like it's almost like if you were to tell me like what your interest was, I could tell you the best way to plug into that interest. 
So like if it's bail, it's Michigan Liberation's bail fund. If it's people who are like trying to avoid jail and prison, I would say helping people with the fines and like fines and fees. I think Michigan Liberation is going to start a fund to address that specific population. Um, Ashley, we, I mean, we've had previous experience with adopting families. So when you mentioned the halfway house near um, city airport, that's kind of what I thought about. That's something that we've done before uh, through the diocese, but directly through the diocese, but we've like adopted families and made sure that, you know, we sort of supported them in their first years here in this country. And that's when you mentioned the halfway house, that's kind of what I was thinking about. I'm not trying to volunteer to run that thing. I'm just <laughs> I throw it out there. Well, and it strikes me, we were talking, we started the beginning before you came in, Ashley, that um, we just did a Maundy Thursday sock drive and, and managed, we were, our goal was to get 500 pairs of socks for Pope Francis Center, and then we ended up getting 1,300 pairs of socks for Pope Francis Center. So we have a real nice tradition of doing that type of not just monetary fundraising, but like when you mentioned coats and you mentioned feminine products and things like that, right. it occurs to me that even if we didn't adopt a family, we could certainly adopt um, a need. And we're pretty yeah. good at doing that. I think we, we seem to outshine ourselves every time we try something like that. And I, because I got so interested in this issue, I started try, like researching like, where are these people? And so like last, October, I came home to support efforts to register formerly incarcerated people to vote. Cause a lot of people don't know that people with felony and misdemeanor convictions can vote. And so I found these shelters that have a contract with the Michigan Department of Corrections that house women that are just coming out of prison. So like there's a halfway house on the east side but there's also some shelters around the city that also have the same population. So if you were to do like the feminine, I really think the feminine product drive would be a big one. Then you could just take those materials and say like, this is for this particular population in these facilities. Um, or, the, or the facility. I just also, so yeah, yeah, there's that. Um, I mean, I don't wanna take up all your meetings, but if you wanted to have another conversation about the different, phases of the criminal legal system because when you're talking about bail you're talking about pre-trial then there's incarceration which is what happens to people who are in jail and prison and then there's re-entry which is people who are coming out of jail and prison and working to rebuild their lives and so if you think about it in terms of those buckets that could also help you to narrow your at least your initial focus how many people are you talking about in, incarcerated? What are you talking about? Um, that you want us to help out? Is it a certain amount of people that you help out? She's saying uh, that we should pick. We should pick the the. She's saying that the thing is huge and that we need to pick just a slice of the pie. Well, uh, when we do our holiday drive, which I very much appreciate, Christchurch people who have participated, it's like thirteen women, and we raise like. <laughs> around like $4,500, I know them. So I say to them, what do you need? So like we paid someone's outstanding like gas bill that was like $350. We have the baby that we talked about. We just go crazy and like buy her stuff. Uh -huh. That like we pay phone bills, we pay, we buy boots and coats that, and that's $4,500 split across 12 people. Uh -huh. um, okay. So for, for that effort, that's that. If you're talking about like bailing out, then it's however many the money can cover. If we're talking like $5,000, you might be able to bail out, depending on what the bonds are, like three people. If we're mm -hmm. talking about like incarcerated is just harder and we haven't even like touched on that. But like, you know, I have a client that I send books to that is like a small thing that someone could do once a month for like $40. But actually, um, I think if we knew the people, it would make a bigger impact on us. So I, I just keep coming back to that um, halfway house on the east side so that we could like almost 
I'm thinking about developing a relationship kind of not like you do clearly, you know, you, you're, you're at the head of this, but for us to be able to engage with people, I think would be more beneficial to us. Again, I'm not trying to run a program, but I'm just saying. What if you just, so something that I know Michigan Liberation has been trying to do is keep in touch with the people they bail out. Oh. What if the people that get bailed out- The tracking? We're not just tracking, but also bringing them into the advocacy fight and like empowering people to like take on these issues. So like keeping in touch with them like that. Um, mean like legally? I'm mean sorry, what you said? I, 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 I see that at also things like, uh, yes, keeping in touch with them and uh, encouraging them to get to their bail, uh, not bail, uh, probation uh, appointments, and maybe even helping out there, that kind of thing. Yeah. I don't know or it's like, let's say, I'm just throwing out numbers. Like, let's say you, you give $5,000, three people get bailed out. You get their names, you connect with them, you invite them to the church, they bring their kids, their partner, and then the relationship is started because now oh, they know. know you, you know okay. them, like that type of, okay. and it happens organically, okay, but you're in community with them. Okay. And then the, the needs will arise like, oh, <laughs> you know, now yeah. I need a bus pass or the thing. So before the pandemic, I was just like really dissatisfied with the continuity of what I could do so like we did this holiday thing that was really wonderful but then I was like but what these people really need is like someone to drive them every week to the community center so they can like work on their resume and I felt like I know a lot of women who are older and have some time and could just and have a lot of resources and could spend like an hour a week talking to another woman who's trying to figure out her next steps and say like this is a place where you can go to help with housing this is a job training program like a mentorship program for people because it really the needs are just like humongous. yeah it's it's every single think about building a life and like how much time and energy and resources and effort it takes just to, to just exist and these people are literally really starting at a deficit because many of them have never had that type of support. And I like I debated whether or not to say this, but like the woman that we were talking about with the baby, my dad went and picked her up from the hospital after she had the baby and drove her back to the halfway house because she didn't have that we could tell family that was going to do that. So like we're talking about like the most intimate moments in people's lives, they don't have support. And like, we literally only knew that lady for like two months at that point. Mm -hmm. But like, that's the type of support she needed. Well, see, that's the perfect example. That sounds, that sounds like something that, you know, I could see someone at our church doing. So that was a great example. But it's also heartbreaking if you think about the fact that someone's just given birth and like, my dad's a great guy, but like, she doesn't know him and like to be relying essentially on people that you've just met is like that's so sad that there was like no one else that she could call wow. I think she was thinking about taking an uber and I was like you're not taking an uber you've just given birth like someone should be there to take you home when home was the halfway house right. yeah. well it's uh it's eight twenty seven. um I, I suspect that what we ought to do as a committee is have a, an, another meeting fairly shortly uh, to talk about whether or not um, there are one or more projects of the kind that Ashley has outlined that we want to undertake. Um, because they, they will I mean, it could, it could be something as, as, as simple as uh, allocating some of our outreach fund if we decided we wanted to use the money for that purpose. 
it, it could be something like uh, adopting the, the halfway house or some of the women in it. It could, could I mean, it, there, there are a wide variety of, of activities we could, under, we could undertake. And I think we need to narrow it down a little bit. Um, so I would hope that we could meet maybe in, in, in two weeks and in the meantime, think about what aspect of this general, um, this, this, this general need we think we might be able to fill. Um, does it sound reasonable? Mm -hmm. great. Yeah. I'm also happy to provide any more information that would be helpful as you navigate this because it's a lot to under it's a lot to to wrap your mind around. Yeah. Um, You've been a wonderful. Thank you so much for sharing all of this with us, yeah. Ashley. Mm -hmm. Thank you for yeah, having me. what you're doing. Yeah. We've been Thank listening you. to you yeah. just talk and talk. Don't never apologize. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, it's, we it's also really have. And Seth, would there, is there still, what's the plan in terms of Michigan liberation? Are, are we still going to reach out to them? Oh, I, I think we should. I, I think we ought, to, we ought to talk to them too. I mean, there, there is so much to do. Um, but I, I think, yeah, we, we need to talk to Michigan liberation and, and we, need to, we need to have a session where we kind of think through our what priorities. aspect of the problem we want to become involved in? Um, I mean, I'm, I'm certainly open to other suggestions, but that, that's what occurs to me. Seth, I'm going to be traveling in two weeks, so um, I'll try to tap in if I can, but I'm actually on the road. So okay. um, I'm, right. not, I'm not traveling. I'm still here. <laughs> <laughs> I know you'll catch me up. Okay, well let, let, let's plan. Let's plan to meet in two weeks, which would be the twenty Tuesday, the twenty seventh. Okay. Um, at 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 seven thirty. In the meantime, um, I'll I'll try to send around an email to everybody with regard to 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 some ideas that Ashley has suggested, and we can add to that list or subtract from it as you see as you see fit. But I think it's always easier to, to, to react to something that's on paper in front of you. Absolutely. I took some notes too. Um, and, you know, we have a couple of guests here. And so, um, you know, Gloria, if you're interested in being tapped into that, um, let me know and we, I'll get your email to Seth as well. Or it might be something for you to go back and talk with Hartford a little bit about, or at least you've learned a lot. I, I I know I, okay, I have. I certainly thank you and for offering the opportunity fine. this today uh, in the art class, yeah. and I certainly appreciate this. And as I said here, you know, uh, even through uh, well, the church, but as well as through my sorority and other organizations that I'm a part of, uh, we are definitely interested in uh, the justice. And so uh, I was things were just rolling in my around in my head in terms of how uh, I can take this information forward. Super, super. Well, so feel I'm, free to- I really you know, appreciate you letting me be a part of it. Thank you so thank much. You, thank you for joining it. I'm really, really- Yeah, happy. Gloria, let, let us know uh, if you want to, if you want to get the Zoom invite to the meeting in two weeks, we'll be happy to forward it to you. Um, maybe you can let uh, uh, Eileen know. Yeah, I'll see Eileen in the class, so yeah. yeah. I'll look, I'll look at my calendar and, and see okay. what's, what's going on. But this has just been really great. And I will certainly move the me message forward because I think it's worth doing that. And I, I thank you, Ashley. And I think you are a Hampton grad. Yeah. So am I. Go girl. Oh. <laughs> okay. So many connections. <laughs> All right. Thank and, you. And, and Josephine, tell Al that he doesn't have to be, be hidden there. Uh -oh. <laughs> We'd like to see him too. Uh, there he is. Seth, I know my place. Uh, <laughs> you know my and also, and my wife. I'm lucky to be here. <laughs> she and Joc Jocelyn Burrell has also joined us too, Jossie. I'm glad you came as well. So hopefully you've heard some good things. So, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Thank you for having that. me. Great. Bye. Thank you. Oh, Thank Wonderful. You. Thank okay. You. We'll be in, we'll be in touch, everybody. Thanks very much. Okay. Take care, you guys. Okay.